This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, as they say where I'm from, a, uh, a, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So. Um, although my title is the treatment of type 1A and endoleak, I'm going to actually uh, talk about a very similar spectrum of problems, but uh, uh, the other end of things where they uh, can influence the original outcome. So let's go. My disclosures, as always, I have license and patents to cook, and they support us with research grants. Um, the, the, the problem with uh, type 1 endoleaks lies, as with any other type 1 endoleaks, not so much with the stent graft or often with the implantation, but with the uh, anatomy. Um, it's a problem of mismatch, but when the anatomy is, is distorted, the stent graft is often unable to match that. Here you can see in a little array of aortas, the point I'm trying to make is that nearly every aorta at, um, at that point, the transition between the arch and the descending thoracic aorta has an acute angulation. And if that is where you're trying to implant, you're going to uh, run into some difficulty. Now, what about the option uh, that, that we usually have is just going more proximally? Well, there you're limited by the presence of some, some uh, uh, vessels supplying organs with very poor tolerance for ischemia. So. Here we have the, the uh, unfavorable Gothic arch where the descending and, and uh, aortic arch meet. Uh, there is an acute angle, and the acute angle often exceeds the capacity of the stent graft to, to bend. So what can you do about it? Well, here is, is, a, is a stent graft that I thought had the most promising uh, chance of providing us with a solution up in the thoracic aorta. Um, but what I'm actually depicting here is an abdominal aortic device. They never got so far as to um, make a good thoracic aortic device. But it has a couple of features that you would like to see. One is it's very flexible, and the other it's capable of implanting in a very short segment of non-dilated aorta. Well, what else is out there? Um, here's one of my, my favorite stent grafts, mainly because it's low profile and easy to put in, but also because it's design and the design of its delivery system tend to allow it to accommodate that angle at the distal end of the arch. Uh, one of the things that helped to do that is a, an uncovered stent that um, extends the segment um, that, that is imposing an orientation on the proximal end of the stent graft. Now, I was actually the first one to write a paper on what happens when you put pointy stents into uh, curved, mobile, uh, compliant pieces of aorta, and the answer is they erode their way through. Well, this particular uh, stent graft, it's the, the alpha from Cook, um, has stents that are like the arches on an aqueduct. You know, they, they have soft tops and sharp bottoms, and um, we have not seen any ill consequences of that design. Flexibility, obviously, is something that you'd like to build into your stent graft. The only problem is that you uh, want to combine flexibility with a secure attachment because there's only two things that hold these graphs in place. Um, one is the attachment and the other is stiffness. And if the device has no stiffness and it has no attachment, the big hemodynamic forces that act on the, on the proximal end of the stent graft will make it sit down inside the aorta. And that is something that you have to bear in mind um, when you're treating these short necks and big angulations. Okay, well, I said you can't march into the, into the aortic arch. Well, that's true, but you can't do it without providing an alternative flow to these uh, supraaortic trunks. And how much you need to do depends on how much aorta you need to steal from the arch. So people get ever and ever more aggressive until they find themselves in CT surgeon's territory. Um, and, you know, this for a long time was sort of a standard solution, um, but you, you certainly pay the price for uh, obtaining your inflow from the ascending thoracic aorta. 
Well, what about the option of obtaining your inflow from the thras uh, ascending thoracic aorta without actually operating on it? Uh, what I've depicted here is the snorkel approach, or what we uh, termed when we first uh, discovered this. Not that we were the first to discover it, but we discovered it uh, in a case where proximal end of the stent graft ended up more prox proximal than we wanted it. Um, is just to put a stent in there and channel flow into the uh, arch vessel. Um, equally valid is to, is to put the stent graft downstream and, and channel flow from there. And here you can see sort of an extreme version of this where all the flow is going in the anominate and a, and a collection of uh, bypass grafts is being used to distribute it through, through the brachiosphalic circulation. And the problem with these, and the problem with all of these, is gutters. When you're trying to match two circular objects, or three or four, inside a circular object, you're not going to create a gap-free environment, and blood can leak through these gutters, and if that happens, it's a problem without a remedy. You're really stuck. Well, one of the things that people have discovered is that gutters are unavoidable, but you can mitigate the effects of the gutters. The longer they are, the less likely they are that the, the column of thrombus that, that lines them will transmit enough pressure to uh, undermine the stability of the repair. Now, what happens if you don't have a, a long segment of non-dilated aorta proximal to where you want to repair? Well, you can make one by putting in a stent graft. And that approach, where you put a stent graft in, then you put the, the um, snorkel, then you put another stent graft, is, is described as a sandwich approach. Um, and people have written very enthusiastically about the results of this approach. I just caution one more time, though. If it fails and there's a leak, there's not much you're going to be able to do about it. And the leak leakage rates in these things are at about 20%, primary leakage rates. Most of them seem to resolve, but you have to wonder what the pressures are doing. And I put here, just to show you that I actually do know how to open a journal... Not that I believe anything I read there. Okay, well, what about the cardiac surgeons? I mean, really, we'd hate to see them left with nothing to do. Um, and, and they can provide you with a nice, solid platform on which to base the repair of a descending thoracic aorta. Um, that is, if they put their elephant trunk into the proper lumen. It's, uh, they sometimes have to be reminded that the true lumen is where we want the elephant trunk to go, and if they put it in the false lumen, life gets a little hard. Um, well, what about the completely endovascular alternative? This, like many other things in complex endovascular repair, was pioneered by uh, John Anderson um, in uh, Adelaide. What he'd done here is he had a couple of fenestrations, one for the anominate, one for the left carotid, and he lined them up with the target vessels. That is unbelievably difficult to do. This guy was a genius, he can do it. I wouldn't recommend that anybody else try. Slightly different approach pioneered by Inui and a bunch of Japanese guys also calls for a certain amount of genius in that you have to have the simultaneous deployment of three branches and a stent graft, all without traumatizing the inside of the aorta enough to cause embolism. Didn't work. This was um, one of the approaches that, that we tried in a series of prototypes that we tested in a rubber model. And what we finally concluded, actually what Darren Schneider finally concluded, was that the version that was going to work the best was the simplest, which is probably a, a good rule to follow. And this is the one that we used. Um, it's basically an upside down bifurcated graft that we put in through the carotid artery. Worked very well. The long leg trailed into the anominate. The short leg was extended into the aorta. The resulting bifurcated graft was augmented with some brachiosphalic um, bypass, and uh, this guy did very well. Unfortunately, it wasn't an approach that we could apply very widely because you need to have a, a big carotid and a small aorta. That's not a common combination in patients who have aneurysms and dissections. So here's the anatomy. We were very happy with it. The patient was very happy with it. But an approach that, that has proven to be more successful is the multi, um, is the multi-branched uh, approach with a transfemoral insertion of the primary component. And here you can see that this was a patent in 2000. I mean, this is an old, old idea. It took a couple of years to get it going. This was um, Cherry Abraham's version. 
where there was a little cow catcher on the, on the outer aspect of this, uh, of this attachment site. The problem with that is if you put it in right, it was great, but if you put it in a little bit off, you couldn't get to where you wanted to go because the cow catcher was in your way. So we went with this approach where there were these little landing pads um, that led you into the inner cuffs, and this was the patient we treated little old lady wearing 90 pounds who'd had a thoracoabdominal aneurysm done already and we did the arch. Turned her into the you know, complete full metal jacket with a very uh, high pulse pressure. One of the things that enabled us to do that was a self-orienting sheath with a curve built in it. Um, now, as you might imagine, this is a dangerous area, the complications are bad, and many patients get strokes, or at least they do early in the experience. If you look at the learning curve, it's very steep. People have now extended these kind of techniques into the treatment of, of dissections, type A dissections. As you know, the cardiac surgeon's preference is to put a short ascending thoracic stent graft. Um, that can be a difficult target. One of the ways to deal with that is to actually put a very short nose cone on the, on the graft. And Cook now make this as a standard device. It's one of the sad things in life is that Many of the things that were invented here are now routine in Europe, and they always, always have better equipment than we do. Here are various al alternatives, similar approach, working their way through the product testing and approval process. Don't expect to see any of them that soon. Here's a slightly original approach where the added component is not going to the arch vessel, it's going to the ascending thoracic aorta, but essentially the same concept. But just to to finish on a note of caution, the enemy is, and always will be when working in that part of the body, embolism. Hence this little collection of devices, the umbrella and others, that are all de designed to prevent embolism because that, that piece of aorta is often rather shaggy and uh, will throw little pieces of atheroma into the cerebral circulation. So not there yet, but we're getting there. Thank you.